Hello and welcome to the TLDR show, a podcast where I distill the knowledge of books just for you. I'm your host Abdul Rahman and I'm very excited to have you with me. For today's episode, we continue our series on creativity. In the last episode, we covered Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. We talked about the myth of originality, the importance of quality input, and tips for the creative process. Today, we finally get to learn our boxing lesson and continue our journey and see how we can share our work. Without further ado, let's dive into our third book, Show Your Work, subtitled 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. Let's start by introducing our author. Austin Kleon is a writer who draws. He makes art with words and books with pictures. He's the author of the best-selling books, Newspaper Blackout, and our lovely trilogy, Still Like an Artist, Show Your Work, and Keep Going. You can find a number of his talks at TEDx, Google, South by Southwest, and Pixar on YouTube. You can also find him on Twitter, at Austin Kleon, and on his website, austincleon.com. Show Your Work is an operating manual for self-promotion. As Austin says, if Steal Like an Artist was about stealing from others, Show Your Work is about letting them steal from you. A lot of the ideas in this book are for anyone who works in the creative field. However, even if you don't work in the creative field, you will enjoy it and get some useful bits and pieces here. Let's get to it. In our last book, Steal Like an Artist, we stopped at sharing your work. Now, when we talk about sharing your work, we're not just talking about sharing the end product. We're talking about the work in progress, the mistakes, the lessons learned, and the small bits and pieces that make your work. When you open up about the process, people will get attracted to you, and they may offer their fellowship, feedback, or even patronage. Today, we will follow Simon Sinek's advice from his TED talk on how great leaders inspire action and start with the why. Then, we will go on to the 8 commandments of show your work. So, why do you need to share your work? Well, in episode 1, in Predictably Irrational, we talked about how our expectation of something can affect our experience of it. If you share a painting, for example, but there is no context or story behind it, people may admire it, but they won't feel a connection to it. But if you share your inspiration, process, and the story behind it, people will come to value it even more. I remember I was listening to the song Monsters by James Blunt with a friend. In it, there is the following line, I'm not your son, you're not my father. And my friend was like, what the heck is this? Without the proper context, these are the worst words to put in a song. But when I explained how James' father was battling cancer, and the story behind the song, his view changed completely. So, make sure to tell a story, a well-structured one. A book which had been recommended many times is On Writing Well by William Zinser. But if you don't want to go through a whole book, there is a blog article by Scott Adams titled The Day You Become a Better Writer. It's less than 300 words and it delivers big times. Now, the first commandment of Show Your Work is to find a senius or a community. There is a myth about how creativity gravitates to the lone genius. But in reality, ideas are nurtured, developed, and eventually stolen in communities that share similar interests. This makes the act of creating a social activity and brings a sense of harmony to it. In a way, joining a community gives us a sense of unity, which was our last weapon of influence from episode 5 in Persuasion. And as we mentioned, unity enhances the support within the community. Let's take a detour and see some interesting examples of how powerful communities can be. The first is the coffee houses in London in the 17th century. Garraway Coffee House is one of the most famous examples. In it, the walls were full of books, and the tables were long with chairs on each side to facilitate conversation between strangers. The interesting thing about coffee houses like Garraway was that they were a place for discussions, from new books, scientific discoveries and tools, 
to even dissecting animals and running lecture series. The discussions were continued from the Royal Society of London to the coffee houses and vice versa. This resulted in a huge network of exchanging ideas and an explosion of knowledge to the degree that a coffee house was named Penny University. You just pay a penny for the coffee and you get to watch and listen to some of the greatest minds discussing and sharing their work. The second example is the origins of Silicon Valley. I'll be brief here. One of the major reasons for Silicon Valley's success is the networking effect. This was between prestigious universities in the area like Stanford and big tech companies like Intel and IBM. This was a driving force for companies and startups to grow. I'll link in the show notes to a video that shows the history of Silicon Valley by the lovely people at Slidebean. I will also link to an interactive article from the blog Melting Asphalt by Kevin Sembler titled Going Critical, which shows you the effects of networking. Let's get back onto track. Now, we understand how important it is to find a community. After joining one, Austin asked us to be an amateur. If you're saying, this is different from what Pressfield was telling us about turning pro, let me try to solve this apparent contradiction. In both books, they ask for the same. Continue to learn, love your work, and always be adaptive. What you should do is to embody the attitude of the professional from the war of art, while having a heart of an amateur. Maybe we should come up with a new word. I will go with promature. Now, the second commandment is to think process, not product. When we hear any song, for example, there are two things, the finished song in front of us and the process that created it. This expands what we consider being our work. Instead of only sharing the end product, take your followers with you, behind the scenes. Let them see how the pie is baked. Few things could happen. It will deeper your connection with them, give them an opportunity for feedback on your process, and let more people steal from you. So, I decided to post a quick screenshot on my story of the first episode raw recording. I'm doing this right now. Definitely not because I want to procrastinate taking the notes. Let me know what would you like to see from my working process, and I will happily share it. Anyhow, document and share your process. Keep your thoughts in a journal or audio record them. Take a picture or a video, and scan your handwritten notes. In all of Austin's books, at the end, you will see drafts, handwritten notes of ideas, names of chapters, and newspaper blackouts. It's always a joy for me to look at them. Also. As you get more proficient, share and teach your secrets whenever you learn or discover something new. Now, our third commandment is to share something small every day. We have expanded what we consider our work, so share the small bits and pieces on daily basis. You can have them in stories, YouTube shorts, email newsletter, TikTok, or wherever you share your work. So, which part do you share? Don't absolutely share everything. Share the helpful, entertaining, and the ones that you wouldn't mind your mother seeing. If you're doubting yourself, just keep it as a draft for another time. A tiny tip that I liked from this chapter is to get a good domain name, if possible with your name on it. There is a blackout newspaper from the book that reads, Go on, Google me. Well, wouldn't that be amazing? Imagine if your next employer contacted you because they googled you. This is the same as the fourth type of luck that we discussed in episode 6. A good number of people have their names in their domain, including Austin himself, Tim Ferriss, Naval, and Paul Graham. In my opinion, the best portfolio is of Derek Severus. On the homepage, there is me in 10 seconds, me in 10 minutes, what I'm doing now, and contact me. Then as you scroll, you get to see his projects, his books, his podcast, and articles. If you don't have one with your name, make sure to have one for your brand. There are many good and easy website builders that it won't even take you two hours to create a good-looking portfolio for yourself, like Wix and Squarespace. Now, our fourth commandment is to open your cabinet of curiosities. In Still Like an Artist, we mentioned how important is it to be curious and the importance of quality input for quality output. 
By being curious, you will stumble across interesting things here and there. And just like a museum, each of us has a physical or mental collection of interesting things that make you who you are. It could be the music you listen to, the YouTube videos, movies, and TV series that you watch. Maybe you are a master at playing Dota, or a sourdough head that only bakes their bread. Whatever you are into, it is what makes you. A nice quote from the book by Ira Glass, a public radio personality from NPR, is All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have a taste. But there is this gap. For the first couple of years, you make stuff. It's just not that good. It's trying to be good, it has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, is still a killer. I know that now, some of you will be thinking, I like this and that, but I'm embarrassed to share them. It's exactly these embarrassing hobbies that make you who you are. Don't edit yourself too much, or you will suffocate. Like Dave Grohl, the American musician, said, I don't believe in guilty pleasures. If you effing like something, like it. Unless it's a chocolate cake, and you are on a diet, and your friend is bringing it that night. Then, it's only guilt and no pleasure. So, since you're now sharing where do you get your input, make sure to credit the creators. After all, we're stealing like an artist, not a thief. Add context to it when possible, and always link back. This way, you give people who follow you the chance to create their own tree, and branch out into knowing new people. Another part of sharing your work with the world is for you to talk about yourself at social gatherings. Make sure you can explain what you do to a child all the way to a senior citizen and everyone in between. Think of it as one of Wired YouTube videos where they have an expert explain a topic at five different levels of difficulty. From a child's level of understanding all the way to an expert level. So, you should have your own levels of telling your story to match your audience's level. Remember from Wimbigly to pace and lead. And as my professional communication skills course tutor used to say, keep it short and simple. I'll link to wired YouTube videos in the show notes. Now, our fifth commandment is don't turn into human spam. Let me explain. What we have been building so far is how to share and become a contributor. There are two extremes to it that we need to avoid. The first one is the hoarder. They are the ones who just keep everything to themselves. They share no secrets, lessons or resources. It's all theirs and theirs alone. The second extreme is what Austin calls human spam. This one isn't willing to listen, watch or care about anyone else's work. For them, it's only their work that needs to be shared and enjoyed. They forget that it's a give and take. Remember reciprocation from episode 2. Another type of people that you need to avoid becoming and meeting are vampires. Not the Dracula type, but a different one. The story originates from Pablo Picasso. He was infamous for sucking all the energy out of the people he met. So you would come and spend time with him. By the end of the day, you would leave nervous and exhausted. While he would go back working all night using your energy. We all know people who just drain your soul when hanging out with them. But it applies to more than people. Your vampire could be your job, a hobby that you practice, or even somewhere you go to. The common point is that, after leaving it, you feel drained of energy and will. So next time you meet one of these vampires, throw them with a garlic hat. Okay, maybe not the garlic, but don't stay with them. Now, our sixth commandment, is to learn to take a punch. We covered how to take criticism in the previous two books. In Still Like an Artist, we learned about the man in the arena. And today, at last, we come to our boxing lesson. Just as you will meet your companions along the way, you will also meet the self-acclaimed critics and the trolls. Don't waste your time and energy on them. Austin's wife used to yell at him by saying, quit picking fights on Twitter and go make something. Remember, What matters at the end of the day is the work. The first lesson here is from the war of art. Don't take it personally. The second is to learn how to take a punch. Austin used a boxing analogy here, and I like it so much that I won't even try to change it. Here is how you take literal and metaphorical punches 
in five simple steps. Step one, relax and breathe. Your worst fear won't probably happen. And if it does, it won't be as bad as you think. So two things here. The first is a quote from Seneca, the Stoic philosopher. He said, we suffer more in our imagination than in reality. The second, practice meditation or fear setting. Fear setting is a technique I heard from Tim Ferriss. There are three steps to it. Define, prevent, and repair. Let's take an example. You take a piece of paper or you can write it on your laptop. At the top, you start with your hypothetical fear. For example, you write, what if I quit my job? Or what if I ask that girl out? Or what if I fail to find a job in the next two weeks? You draw three columns, one for define, one for prevent, and the last one for repair. In define, you write what could happen if you did your fear. Let's take an example of not finding a job. In define, you could write, number one, my savings would run out in two weeks. Number two, I may fall into depression. You keep writing the results that you fear would happen. Then you move to column two, prevent. Here, you will be asking yourself, what could you do to prevent the things in column one from happening? Or at the very least, decreasing their possibility. So for your saving, you could say, I will find a part-time job. For the depression, if you know a close friend who is helpful in this situation, maybe you can contact them and have a talk with them. Then you move to column 3, repair. Here you assume that the worst case scenario happened. What can you do to repair it? For the savings, you can ask a family member for a loan. For depression, you can schedule a visit to your psychiatrist. So remember, what if, then define, prevent and repair. Now, back to our boxing lesson. The second step to take a punch is to strengthen your neck. You do this by getting critiqued a lot. Put more work out there, let them take their best shots and keep going. The third step is to roll with the punches. Since criticism is coming either way, have fun with it. Do they hate your corny jokes? Add more of them. In the end, it's all for you. Step four, protect your vulnerable areas. In boxing, these would be the chin, liver, kidney, etc. For you, if your work is too sensitive or you aren't ready to share it yet, you can always keep it as a draft. And also remember, vulnerable areas are few and select. So don't use this as an excuse and say that none of your work is ready to be shared. The last step is to keep your balance. Don't burn bridges with people close to you. Maintain a balance between both your work and your life. With these five steps, you have a good foundation to take down the critics and the trolls. Now, our seventh commandment is to sell out. We finished our boxing lesson and your work is out there. It would be nice to make a living out of it. After all, if you love it, making money out of it would be amazing. Let's take a quick detour and introduce a new concept called the hedgehog. It's by Jim Collins in his amazing book, Good to Great. We mentioned him in episode 6, when we talked about another principle of his, the flywheel principle. The hedgehog is a concept that works for companies, but can also be used for individuals. It's a Venn diagram with three circles that intersect in the middle. In the first circle, you write what you're deeply passionate about. We have been answering this question throughout Still Like an Artist. In the second circle, you write... What can you be the best in the world at? We answered this one in episode 4 when we talked about Scott Adams' talent stack. In the last circle you answer what drives your economic engine or how can you make money out of it. What you want is to have something that you love, build a talent stack around it and find a way to monetize it. The intersection of these three circles is what moves companies and individuals from good to great. So, for artists to make some money, there is a ton of ways. Sponsorship, a small buy me a coffee tag on your website, or merchandise. As Austin says, think of it as passing around the hat after a performance. But do it only after you feel you're putting something worthy out there. There is a catch though. The moment money is involved, you would start to see how much people really value your work. Not you, your work. 
Remember, never take it personally. A perfect example is a story from the book about Austin's friend, John T. Unger. He would be doing a poetry reading, and a guy would come afterward and say to him, Your poem changed my life, man. To which John would say, Oh, thanks. Want to buy my book? It's only $5. The guy would look at the book and say, Nah, that's okay. To which John would respond, Geez, how much is your life worth? So when it comes to making money, here is Austin's golden rule. If an opportunity comes along that will allow you to do more of the kind of work that you want to do, say yes. If an opportunity comes along that would mean more money, but less of the kind of work that you want to do, say no. And when things work out for you, pay it forward and help those around you and other creators. The last commandment in the book is to stick around, to never quit your work, to use the momentum that you gain from ending any project to start a new one, or as Austin calls it, chain smoking. This is how I apply chain smoking. Whenever I reach the last few pages of a book, I'll stop. In my next reading session, I'll come back, finish it, and start a new one directly. You also need to remember, rest is as important as your work. You don't need to wait for retirement or annual leave to have a break. Take smaller ones daily or weekly. You can do it while commuting, exercising, or walking in nature. Just disconnect from the world around you and recharge for a bit. To wrap things up, we started with why it's important to share the work behind the work. Adding context to it increases its value in the eyes of the receiver. We also expanded on what we call work to include the end product, the inspirations, failures, lessons learned, and even the scraps from brainstorming. Beside this, we mentioned how important it is to find a community that you can connect, share, and steal from them. Also, our mini-boxing lesson taught us how to take a punch from critics and trolls, and how important it is for you to never stop and always keep going. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Now, go and share your work. Just let it out to the world. Send me your thoughts and work over Twitter and Instagram at TLDR Show. For the next episode, we come to the finale of both the trilogy and the series. And as we did with the last point from Still Like an Artist, we will expand on the last point here of never quitting when we discuss keep going. As always, make sure to check the website at tldr-show.com for the show notes links to social media, episode transcript, and the extra good stuff. Till next time, be curious, be critical.